Hello, lovely students. We have come back to some more exciting lecture time for you. We are going to be learning about uh, imperialism, continuing to learn about imperialism. And today we will be talking about imperialism in China that was happening in the 1800s and the early 1900s. So as we do this, uh, you will be stopping periodically as I tell you to pause to do some prompts as you work on some quick writes and that is what you will be doing today that is your assignment is to put some good energy and effort into those prompts so be sure to do them fill them out you'll see them on your google uh, classroom assignment sheet and you can do them as you're watching this video all right so let's get started with this um, we have talked about china before of course but we haven't checked in in a while since the 1700s or so and let's talk about what was happening First half, of course, we know the Industrial Revolution was strengthening the power of European countries, right? So you had all those European countries that had gone through the Industrial Revolution and were fighting over Africa. They had been fighting over the Americas. There was all this scrambling for territory. And, of course, India, which had already been conquered. So you can see from this map here, of course, it says in this question, what will happen in Asia? Well, in Southeast Asia, some stuff had already happened. You can definitely see here where India uh, had been colonized by the British, largely through the efforts of the British East India Company. And over time, they had taken control of the entire country. By the, late, by the 1850s, Britain was officially uh, in control of India as a colonizing power in a more direct manner than much of uh, Britain's rule had been done. They also controlled Burma over here. Um, up through Pakistan here and had a lot of back and forth here in Afghanistan, but ultimately Afghanistan has been a very difficult place for people to conquer. Um, also, there was a, the French had control over here in what was called Indochina, which we now know as Vietnam and some areas outside of that. Um, and down south also uh, the British had control of part of Indonesia, what is now Malaysia. Um, in the Indonesian archipelago, whereas Indonesia itself was actually under the control of D the Dutch, uh, same people who had originally controlled South Africa. So much of Southeast Asia was actually already under uh, control of the colonial powers by the mid to late 1800s. Of course, there's a big, big question here. The Russians, as you can see, of course, we talked about, they controlled their own region. Um, and the Ottomans, who were the Turks, were in control of this area over here. And we'll get more into that. But what area is not being colonized at the moment? Well, I think you could probably see that from the map. That would be China. China is divided at this point in history as we go into the 1800s into two main social classes. Really, the upper and lower class. It was still a pretty traditional society based on a somewhat feudal system, uh, legalism being the primary, uh, the primary form of government, a royal dynasty that had been in control for a very, very long time, um, the, King the Qing dynasty. Uh, it was a um, very wealthy, wealthy state. And it is, we know it had been unified a couple thousand years prior to that, big place. In many ways, the center of the world's economy for centuries. It was number one in population. Uh, the, had the highest population in the world. It was rich in resources. Uh, in the central region here, in all these central areas, you can see all these rivers in the country that were producing so much food that fed the entire country. So many goods. There were mines. There was all kinds of stuff in China. They produced most of their own domestic wants and needs within the country. And remember, China essentially withdrew from the international economy, uh, from a lot of trade, following the collapse of value of silver in the 1790s. It had mainly at that point been importing silver from the Americas. But as more and more silver was produced, the economy of China collapsed because they had pegged their currency, they had made their currency into silver. And as silver declined in value, well, their, their currency declined in value. So that was it. By the way, over here also you'll note this is where the island of Taiwan is, the big island off of China, and we will be talking more about Taiwan as we go further along. But again, brief recap here, China's divided into 
upper class, which is the royals and the bureaucratic class and the wealthy merchant class, and then the lower class, which is a vast number of peasants in a largely farming society with some very densely populated cities and trading areas, Shanghai, Beijing, um, Guangzhou, Victoria, uh, which was soon to be Hong Kong. Also, Victoria, that should give you a little bit of a hint about where we're going with this, right? So at various times in history, China had limited contact with the West and allowed limited trade with foreign powers. Many people in China viewed Western culture as barbaric, as violent, and often considered they considered it to be somewhat stupid and forceful. Um, and uh, and definitely not as refined in taste and in culture. Definitely very much considered to be a outsider culture that was to be kept at arm's length. Um, that's not to say they hadn't traded, but they limited it to varying degrees at varying times. And it's very important that starting in the late 1700s, it was limited quite a bit. And that's that's a very important thing that impacts what happened in the 1800s, which coincidentally was during the period of industrialization. So here's before the Qing Dynasty was in control of all of this region. That was the control of the Qing Dynasty in China, which had been in control for hundreds of years. After the colonization happened, after this, after the imperialistic movements that happened from the uh, European powers, you can see the results, and we're going to talk about how all this went down. But there's spheres of influence here. There's British, the British are the purple areas here. The French are these big red striped areas. Uh, German is here. A little bit of Germany had some control of this region up in the north, not too far away from Beijing. Um, Japanese, and we are going to be talking about how important that is coming up because the Japanese, by this point, had actually become their own colonizing power. And also you'll notice the same color as Korea here. And that also is something that's very important. So Japanese areas um, down here. And then the Russian areas as well. Actually, this is the Russian area. Sorry, I called it French. But actually the French the French areas were, uh, were down here. My apologies. But the British and the French also shared control of a few areas. Uh, but this is the Russian area. Um, and Macau, which is this one port. It was Portuguese territory. And there were... A bunch of these ports that have been controlled first, and I'm sure you remember that from the scramble for Africa. The Europeans were very good at taking control of strategic ports and then using them as springboards for further colonial control. So these shaded areas represent spheres of influence of the different colonial powers because they did not officially own parts of China in the same way that they were taking direct or and pretty and indirect but pretty clear control of areas of, of Africa and the Americas. They uh, they owned, they had these different parts where they controlled them, their spheres of influences uh, outside of these strategic ports like Hong Kong um, and Macau and so on. But they had control, especially economic control in these areas. Nonetheless, you'll note that the only area that was really under control of the Qing Dynasty at this point, uh, this is the mid 1800s by around, you know, the the mid to late 1800s is this region, just this area. So let's talk about that. Why do you think the colonizing powers of Europe opted for a more indirect approach to imperialism in China? Why did they opt to this route for this really indirect, seemingly indirect approach where they didn't actually own the areas outright? So I want you to pause and write about that in your uh, in your, your sheet that you're working on. So I want you to write at least a paragraph on this. Pause and now. Okay, so as you're thinking about this, why you're thinking the colonizing powers of Europe opted for a more indirect approach to imperialism in China, well, you have to obviously think about what was going on in the country and China's own status as an international power for so long. It's impossible to escape the fact that China had been the center of the world's economy for a long time. And it's clear that they couldn't use these social Darwinist ideas of 
well, China is obviously not a civilized area, so we have to, you know, civilize it with our superior civilization and so on. That's not to say missionaries weren't at work trying to Christianize people, but it was a more, it was a much harder call to call China a non-civilized part of the world that didn't have its own uh, claim on its territory. So this kind of merchant direct, indirect control of economic resources became the watchword for what was happening and what was going to happen coming up in the next uh, long period of time. And here is the person who is very, very responsible for a lot of this. This is a very important individual in Europe during this period of time. Who is she? Anybody recognize her? Any guesses? If you guessed Queen Victoria of England, you are right. This is Queen Victoria, the famous Victoria of the Victorian era. Now, you remember England had a parliament and had a very much relatively democratic system at this point. It was growing more and more democratic. But that is not to say that in the 1800s that England did not still have a powerful royalty, a powerful monarchy. And Victoria was, in many ways, sort of the last gasp of that uh, old-style monarchy in England. She ruled from 1837 until 1901. That Yes, that is 64 years of her reign. That was how long she was in charge of the country. That is a very, very long time. In fact, it defined an era for much of Europe and particularly England and part of the United States in terms of our architecture and us being a former colony called the Victorian era. And I'm sure you know, you know, there are these Victorian houses around here that you'll see that date to this era. Um, Victorian architecture, Victorian morals. It's a word that you will run into over and over and over again. Literature, all this stuff. Known for its uh, sexual uptightness and codes, known for uh, various intellectual and uh, economic achievements, and lots and lots and lots of imperialism. It ruled, she ruled during the peak of the Industrial Revolution. She was very much a large driving force in terms of making sure that the British Empire was expanded. She ruled over what was then the most powerful nation in the world, little old England, the most powerful nation in the world. Some call her the grandmother of Europe. And yes, she was quite severe. Apparently she had a quite a sense of humor as well, though. But, um, you know, you got to have a sense of humor when you... When you uh, have a serious look like that, right? So what did she have in common with these bad guys? You see a guy in the DEA cutting down marijuana plants there. That's a dated image. Doesn't happen much anymore. That's Scarface, Al Capone over on the left, and uh, another mobster guy, right? So what does she have in common with these bad guys? The Queen of England? What? Why, why is there all these drug lords and the Queen of England? Well, there's a simple reason for that and a simple answer for that. There's a drug. Any guesses what it is? Opium. She oversaw a massive international drug trade in opium. And opium is a drug from which morphine and heroin come from. You can also just smoke it as an extract of the opium poppy, which you see above. Uh, it is a highly addictive very dangerous and uh, very, very widespread drug that has killed incredible numbers of people for a very, very long time. By the way, the ladies in the lower corner there, that is a Victorian tea party. And where does tea come from? Hmm. Well, that would be India and China. Great Britain had long wanted to trade with China. However, China was not particularly interested. How did this lady become a drug lord? Well, Britain began importing opium into China. They started smuggling it in and selling it there through their strategically located ports that they began to take control of. In the early 1800s, the Chinese became addicted to opium, and the British used drug money from this to trade for tea. They wanted to get tea, which was their own drug, because tea is caffeinated. It, too, is a drug. Opium had been in China for some time. It wasn't brand new, and it was likely introduced to China 
and East Asia in general in the 6th or 7th century AD, you know, we're talking about a thousand years before this, um, through trade along with Silk Road. This connected the Mediterranean cultures of Europe into Central Asia, India, and China. Um, the region that stretches from Afghanistan to Pakistan, Pakistan, eastward into India, Burma, and Thailand, still today produces much of the world's opium poppies, much of the heroin that exists in the world. Um, the first opium war, however, where there were wars that ended up being fought of this, because when China started bringing opium into China, well, we can assume that China wasn't necessarily going to be very happy with this, because one third of China became addicted to opium. This is an image of an opium den in China, where people would go and smoke marijuana and... Uh, well, just they wouldn't really do a heck of a lot. They'd spend money and smoke opium and oftentimes overdose and die because it's very easy to overdose. In this, this is a, these are Victorian ladies being taken on a tour through the opium dens. I think this is actually from a Chinatown in San Francisco, if I remember right. This is not an opium den in China, but it's actually a, uh, a tour of the opium dens of Chinatown in San Francisco at the time in the 1860s. So this brings us to prompt number two. Did the British have the right to import opium into China? And why do you think they did it? Other than the fact that they wanted to trade the money for tea and trade it and do an exchange here for tea, why do you think the British imported opium into China? What are some reasons? Think about what we've learned with British colonialism in general, right? Think about Cecil Rhodes and what happened in Africa. So take a pause here and write at least a paragraph. And pause. Okay, coming back. So why do you think they did it? Great question. Lots of potential reasons, right? Obviously the money was involved, but also obviously we have certain ideas of how the British colonized things. Remember, they were really into divide and rule with different peoples, as were the other British or the other uh, European powers. And by introducing a highly addictive, socially disruptive drug into a country, which already has some economic and social and military problems from economic collapse of not that long ago, uh, they might be able to introduce a certain element of chaos that could potentially open the country up for more imperial control. So here is a response to pressure from the West from a, uh, a Chinese intellectual named Lin Sesu, quoted in China's response to the West. And the quote is, by what right do they, the British merchants, use the poisonous drug opium to injure the Chinese people? I have heard that the smoking of opium is very strictly forbidden by your country. That is because the harm caused by opium is clearly understood. Since it is not permitted to do harm to your own country, then even less should you, uh, should you let it be passed on to the harm of other countries. So prompt number three leads to this. Why did Lin Seisu oppose the opium trade with Britain? Explain. From what you just read, use that primary source. Why did Lin Seisu oppose the opium trade with Britain? Explain in a paragraph, at least. And pause. Okay. Coming back. Remember, in the 1700s, the British Empire conquered a major poppy growing region of India, and rather than quash the production of opium, they began to smuggle opium from India into China through the East India Company. There was a lot of trade in this. They used the profits from the lucrative opium trade to buy and export tea, silk, porcelain, and other Chinese luxury goods back to Europe. And this trade caused opium addiction in China to rise steeply. The Qing Dynasty, attempting to curb the havoc caused by widespread opium addiction and by critics like Lin Seisu, who saw the widespread havoc being caused and obviously were critical of these imperial ambitions of the British, um, they decided to outlaw opium importation and cultivation, which was, as you might figure, was going to have an impact. So the Chinese government attempted to ban opium they asked Great Britain to stop the trade, and the British refused. 
So what do you think would happen here? If you guessed war, well, you're pretty much right. The British declared war on China over trade. They, uh, you can see from this 20th of January uh, headline in Melbourne, Australia, actually, which is, remember, a, a, a British colony, uh, in 1857, serious disruption between British and Chinese authorities at Canton, Admiral Seymour compelled to bombard this town. You'll note, however, this is actually, this is actually from the Second Opium War, and we're going to be finding out more about that in a minute. Um, this is another picture of an opium den from within China. And also, there were British people getting addicted too, British merchants and soldiers. So the Opium Wars were from 1839 to 1842 and 1856 to 1860. And at first, the first Opium War uh, was mainly the British. They used what they called gunboat diplomacy to force the Chinese government to keep the ports in Shanghai, Canton, and elsewhere open to trade. Essentially, they were under control of European colonial powers. And uh, they actually uh, ended up getting Hong Kong in this period of time, in, the, uh, in 1842. China ceded Hong Kong to the British in the Treaty of Nanking following the First Opium War. Uh, the Chinese were afraid of the superior military technology of the British. They were developing stronger cannons and greater, uh, greater weapons, uh, high, uh, semi early versions of uh, automatic weapons, relatively automatic weapons. This really came later, but there were weapons that could fire at a greater rate. Um, really nasty stuff, bigger bombs. All these things were starting to happen. Uh, there was social unrest in China from opium addiction. And uh, the, this first forced China to open itself for trade under European conditions. The later uh, war, during the second opium war of 1856 to 1860, the British and the French actually joined forces against China to make the opium trade permanently legal in the country and to extract further ex concessions, including the right to actually own property, to actually own these areas, not just trade and have uh, these spheres of influence and like essentially control. They want to actually own it from the Chinese emperor's family. So beyond Hong Kong, they wanted to be able to own more Chinese land. Despite the European success in opening China to trade, Many in Europe, China, and elsewhere actually considered the opium wars and the resulting spread of opium addiction, which again, you saw in this picture, it was going to Europeans as well. Uh, they considered it to be a villainous and immoral use of military power. This was really mercenary and really forceful and really obviously just about money. In the British Parliament, William Ewart Gladstone denounced the first opium war as, quote, a war more unjust in its origin a war more calculated in its progress to cover this country with permanent disgrace. Gladstone's younger sister, Helen, it should be noted, suffered from opium addiction. Uh, China's losses in the opium wars ushered in what is known in China as the quote-unquote century of humiliation, which ended with the Japanese defeat in World War II after they had occupied China and the eventual establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, which is communist China under Mao Zedong. And we will learn about that, of course. So props four and five. I want you to work on these right now. Why was China not particularly interested in trading with the West? That's prop number four. And number five, how was England ultimately able to establish favorable trading rights in China? I want you to explain these things given the evidence that you just learned from the lecture, okay? So one paragraph minimum each. And pause. Okay, so these were essentially a review, right? Why was China not particularly interested in trading with the West? Well, we talked about a few of those things, right? There was the closed nature of society that had been happening after various economic issues. There wasn't that much interest in Western goods because they had so much production of their own that they had done. Uh, they had most of their own goods covered. And there was a certain amount of disdain for Western traditions as well. There was what was considered to be a, uh, you know, they considered them to be a barbaric society. And also, obviously, the West was very aggressive. And they were uh, colonizing the world, and China was not ignorant to this. So how was England able to ultimately able to establish favorable trading rights in China? What well, we just learned about, right? 
There were opium. There were these wars that were started by their introduction of opium, uh, that created a broad, broad spread, a widespread addiction in the country that caused huge social rifts and destabilized the country, and uh, was allowed allowed them to be able to then fight, have an excuse to fight these wars, which forced the country open more. And these wars were won on the basis of um, military, essentially military superiority and uh, coercion, and also some uh, issues with China's own economic strength at the time. So they forced themselves in, also strategic alliances with other European powers like France. And we're going to learn about how this expanded more to other European and non-European colonial powers coming up. So the Treaty of Nanking, as we mentioned, ended the Opium Wars, where the Chinese were forced to accept British terms of surrender. This is where the spheres of influence were truly adopted. They gave a foreign power, in this case, special economic privileges in the affected areas in China, as we saw in the map in the very beginning, right? As we saw in the map, China was split up, and Britain gained direct colonial control of Hong Kong. There is that map again, right? The spheres of influence. Also, you'll note another important thing down here that's going to play into the next section, the Philippines, U.S. controlled, the United States, and you can see little arrows about what the United States are doing, and this is going to play very big into what we're going to learn about next. By the way, on a historic side note, one of the other areas that was actually in Southeast Asia, the only area that remained independent was actually what was then called Siam which is now Thailand, and they, uh, they played some very masterful pol political games in strategic alliances with different um, European powers to maintain the independence of their kingdom. So Thailand actually remained independent while the rest of Southeast Asia was colonized. Um, it's interesting things to note. Bhutan and Nepal up there too next to China. So the Philippines were taken control by the United States. But first off, before we go into that, I want you to look at this cartoon related to what we just learned. What do you think this cartoon is saying? And is there any other event that we have recently studied that this reminds you of? Hmm, does this ring any bells? Why don't we take a pause, write at least a paragraph on it, and pause. Okay. Well, I'm sure you can think about what this might remind you of, and it might have to do with something that was scrambling, maybe, but you definitely see some carving up going on here, right? Some hints. This guy's German. This is Queen Victoria. This is a Russian guy. The Russian Tsar. This is Japan, and again, we're going to talk about that. And over here, actually, I think this is actually symbolizing the United States and France. It's actually, sorry, this is France, not the United States. The, and that's France looking over the shoulder here. And then uh, up here, well, that would be China. That would be the, the Qing Dynasty. And this big pie says China. So foreigners enter China. Britain, France, Germany, and Russia all claim spheres of influence. The USA, as we saw, who were controlling the Philippines now, had taken colonial possession of the Philippines from Spain, which had been in control of it before. Uh, the USA felt left out and declared the open door policy in 1899. China's doors, which are to say its vast markets, must be open to merchants of all nations to sell their goods. Um, so... The open door policy was a trade agreement between the United States, United States, China, Japan, and these European countries. The U.S. Secretary of State John Hay created the open door policy in 1899 to 1900 to allow the U.S., Japan, and these countries, quote unquote, equal trade access to China, to its markets. A country that previously had no trade agreements. They could tell people to come and go as they pleased. The open door policy lasted nearly 50 years until the Communist Party's 1949 victory in China's civil war. Although, uh, obviously, during World War II, when Japan was in control of the country, that was a period when it wasn't happening either. The U.S. got into this game kind of late, the whole imperialism game. 
it was a pretty recent country, right? It was formed in 1789 or, you know, in 1776 after the, you know, after the Decla Declaration of Independence, had a constitution in 1789, you know, it was a new country. And it wasn't until after the Spanish-American War ended in 1898 that the U.S. began to take, take a deep interest in China. At the end of that war with Spain, the U.S. ended up with a large amount of land in Asia under its colonial, own colonial control, in particular, the Philippine Islands. Uh, this newly acquired land caused the U.S. to look more closely at China, and they saw trading with China could earn them a lot of money. Chinese immigrants had gone back and forth to the United States for well over a century at this point, um, in particular in the mid-century during the expansion into the West and during the gold rush. And the U.S. saw this as a relationship that they wanted to explore on both ends. And uh, they felt that trading with China could earn them a great deal of money. China was weakened militarily and economically by an 1895 war and fought with Japan, which lost them, cost them control of part of the country that Japan had taken a sphere of influence within. And uh, they were poorly positioned to bargain on their own behalf. So when the U.S. proposed quote-unquote, equal trading rights in China for all foreign powers. This was called the open door policy. China must open its door to all powers equally. And the U.S. presented this as, hey, we're doing this to keep anybody from taking too much control, right? Let's take a look at how this goes, who the winners and losers were in this. So the U.S. is playing the big, you know, we're the, we're the good guy here. We're opening this up to everybody. But, you know, is it? I mean... Let's think about this for a minute. So China got, you know, freedom, I guess, freedom from direct colonization, right? So, you know, there's, there's freedom from that, sure. Freedom from direct colonization. Um, a minus to this is, you know, for China, they, USA and Europe could push their own interests in China. So they had this sphere of influence, which had some very indirect economic power being wielded over the country, which, you know, in some ways looked pretty like they were controlling a lot of it. So their own interests were being pushed often at the expense of China's interests. The USA, for a plus for them, got to trade with China when it had been left out before. So there was trade happening and the US hadn't really been getting that. It had mainly gotten immigrants from China who were helping build the American economy and were a big boon to it, um, despite the fact that there is incredible xenophobia in the United States. In fact, to the point where people were so anti-Chinese immigrant that they passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which remained in effect well into the 20th century. Um, a very, very racist piece of legislation. But the U.S. wanted their own clause in China. They wanted to be able to trade with China when it had been left out before. Europe uh, saw it as a plus to lease Chinese ports for trade, to develop Navy bases, to develop mineral mines for a new trade market. A minus for Europe is that no one got total control of China. So their little spheres of influence where they had their own total control, well, they couldn't fight over those and get total control. Uh, it was an open door thing. The only one who had no negatives here, but well, seems to be the United States. So the U.S. definitely came out on top of this. However, this is not to say that China was just rolling over. The Chinese wanted reform, and there was nationalism building in the country. The reform was the hope of kicking other nations out of China. This was, for centuries, the world's most powerful economic power. In this idea of reform, they wanted to regain their own autonomy and power. They wanted to get these countries that were exerting this kind of neo-colonial control out. So they were figuring maybe a way to do this would be to learn the Western way of life, to control foreigners. That's going to mean Western political institutions, uh, parliaments and presidents and all, the, all those things. It could mean um, learning the military technologies and adopting them. Even though, remember, gunpowder was invented in China, bombs and so on. Um, learning all these different kind you know different types of treaties different types of uh of ways of colonization themselves perhaps you know western way of life um unfortunately for everybody involved there were rebellions and unrest that ended up coming out of this because this was not a mutually agreed on thing and lots of things rose up as a result of this which one would figure of course 
And these rebellions and unrest over this stuff lasted for half of a century. Many people were supportive of these kinds of reforms, these Western style reforms, but others resisted it because this is a traditional country in which many people wanted to maintain a way of life that had worked for almost a couple thousand years. So, sorry, weird, weird uh, stuff going on there. The Boxer Rebellion happened in 1899 to 1901, and this is a big manifestation of this. It was part of a movement known as the Righteous and Harmonious Society Movement, the Militia United in Righteousness, Yi He Kwan, uh, known in English as the Boxers because many of their members practiced Chinese martial arts, also referred to in the Western world as Chinese boxing. Uh, villagers in North China had been building resentment against Christian missionaries who ignored tax obligations and abused their extraterritorial rights to protect their congregants against lawsuits. They saw this as an abuse of power by Europeans in the country. Uh, the immediate background of the uprising included severe drought, which caused some strains with people, and also uh, disruption, uh, or also, uh, yeah, disruptions by the growth of foreign spheres of influence after the Sino Japanese War, the Chinese and Japanese War of 1895. So, there's months of growing violence and murder in Shandong and the North China Plain against foreign and Christian presence uh, in June 1900. And then this open door policy was like the icing on the cake. People were sick of this and it began in 1899. And then in 1900, it exploded where the boxer fighters convinced they were invulnerable to foreign weapons, uh, bullets in particular, converged on Beijing, uh, the, the capital of China, with the slogan, support the king movement, uh, support the king government, which is the, the royal dynasty, and exterminate the foreigners. Foreigners and Chinese Christians sought refuge in the legation quarter of Beijing. Uh, so that was the goal, to expel all foreigners from, from the country. Um, in response to reports of an invasion uh, by an eight-nation alliance of American, Austro-Hungarian, British, French, German, Italian, Japanese, and Russian troops to, uh, to lift this siege and end this rebellion, the initially hesitant Empress Dowager Shichi, uh, Shichi who was the uh, Shishi, I'm sorry, who was the, the the Empress of China, she supported the Boxers and on June 21st issued an imperial decree declaring war on the foreign powers. Diplomats, foreign civilians, and and soldiers, as well as Chinese Christians in the Legation Quarter, were besieged for 55 days by the Imperial Army of China and the Boxers. Chinese officialdom was split between those supporting the boxers and those favoring some kind of conciliation, led by Prince King, uh, the daughter or the son of, of the Empress Dowager. Uh, the supreme commander of the Chinese forces, the Manchu general Ronglu, Yunglu, uh, later claimed that he acted to protect the foreigners. And officials in the mutual protection of the Southeast China ignored the imperial order to fight against foreigners. So the imperial forces and the boxers are hopelessly divided from the outset. In the end, the, uh, the eight-nation alliance, after being initially turned back, brought 20,000 armed troops to China, defeated the imperial army, and arrived at Peking on August 14th, uh, relieving the siege of the legations. Peking is Beijing. Uh, so uncontrolled plunder of the capital and the surrounding countryside ensued along with the summary execution of those suspected of being boxers. The Boxer Protocol of 7 December 1901 provided for the execution of government officials who had supported the boxers, provisions of foreign troops to be stationed in Beijing, and 450 million taels of silver, which was approximately $10 billion at 2018 silver prices, and more than the government's annual tax revenue, uh, to be paid as an indemnity over the course of the next 39 years to the eight nations involved. So. The country was immediately in debt. This was seen as a huge, huge defeat for Chinese national for, for the Chinese national identity, an incredible betrayal. And in the aftermath of this betrayal, a very strong sense of Chinese nationalism emerged. So the Qing Dynasty, which was forced to accept these reforms in 1911, uh, sorry, this says foreign presidents, it should be foreign. Uh, talks about how the strong foreign presence remained in China until 1947. But the thing about it is there was rising resentment to that and rising rebellion uh, that would end up happening. In the meantime, however, uh, there was a government that was formed. And China became a republic, a Western-style republic in 1911. 
under President Sun Yat-sen, uh, Western influence type of government. He was the head of the Kuomintang or the Nationalist Party. Uh, it was unsuccessful in terms of its reform. People really didn't go along with, uh, especially in the broader areas of the countryside, they really didn't go along with this westernization of the country. There was more or less anarchy and civil war that just kind of started immediately. People were not happy with the uh, new form of government that was so cooperative with the Western powers that were keeping them in debt and forcing the country to come under um, Western markets. So 30 years, you know, the Civil War really heated up and uh, ended up uh, becoming eventually communism under Mao Zedong, which we will learn about, a communist system. Sun Yat-sen at this point, when the communist system took over, uh, fleed to Taiwan with two million people. And uh, that's after they had also been fighting, along with the communists for several years, against the Japanese occupation that happened during World War II. Again, we will learn more about that. So we're going to go into Prop 6 and 7 as we come up near the end today. Number 6, these are review. What were the outcomes of the Opium Wars? What were the outcomes? So write in review. Give me some, you can do some bullet points, some basic stuff. You don't have to do it in full sentences paragraph. And number 7, why did the Boxer Rebellion fail? Why did the Boxer Rebellion fail? I want you to write about that. So give me a paragraph on that. Talk about it. Talk about the different factors. and. Uh, Pause. Okay, so I assume that you got those done. You could easily go review back a few slides to get your answers to those. They are basically review questions. Next class, we are going to be talking about Japan and how it responded to imperial pressures from the West. A hint of that is that it was very different than many other places that we've seen. And we'll talk more about that coming up. So talk to you next week. Um, please uh, get this stuff together and get those props together. Have a great weekend.